So need, needless to say, this is a little bit of a surprise. But I think I have some information I can share with you that um, it's probably not exactly what Bob would share with you about Michael. But this is information that I think sometimes is overlooked in our sport. So I'm going to talk a little bit about starts. And to, to give you an idea how things were, have worked out the last um, 12 hours, I had to call back to Colorado for them to send me a video that I'm going to try and make this work. Um, so I'm just going to point out a few things and I'm going to stop the video as we go to. Most of you won't have to okay, we can stop it right there for but a second. I will say this about these clocks that okay, this, now that there are fins on the back of starting blocks in most places, um, I don't know about your countries, but in our country, we don't have that many starting blocks with fins on them. So we had to buy some kits, some adapter kits, in order to, to make the fins, to set the fins up for our program. But I just, one of the biggest misconceptions about the fins is that everybody wants to pull the fin back far on the block. And you don't want to do that unless you're very, very tall. Matt Grieber's tall, six foot eight. Because what happens when the, when the fin is, is back, your leg is completely straight long before you ever get off the block. So you want to have the fin closer. For the average person, probably set at two or three, and then depending on height, maybe four or five. But everyone, when they first came out, all my athletes, they thought putting it all the way back would be the best thing. And after we watched them for a while, it's much better if you have your leg engaged in the push-off farther into the start as opposed to it being way back and your leg fully extended, therefore not doing any type of, of propelling motion as you leave the block. And, um, the tendency when they first came was everybody wanted to go way back here and put their foot way up and just they felt like they but they want to put a little bit more on the back foot to get more trajectory, to get more power out of the back leg. So it just all depends on the individual. But if you want them to get off the block a little bit faster, you're going to do that by probably putting a little bit more weight on the front so they're not rocked back so far because it'll just take them that much further to get off. So she's about 90, 10, she said. And I'm going to let her go ahead and do a start. And tell you ready to do it. Okay, this. Keep it running. This girl is, uh, her name is Emily Silver. She was a, a um, on the relay in 2008. So this was just done, you know, maybe uh, six months ago. So she's really not in great swimming shape. But she still swims a little bit. And um, I'm going to show, I'm going to point out something when it just comes to, to basic starts that um, will make a huge difference in, in what's, what goes on and how an athlete sets up on the block. Okay, now, this is, this is, uh, you, uh, okay, so what I've done is, On a start, uh, when you watch track, when you watch people get ready to, to run 100 meters, and they, they're down the block, and uh, they put their feet into the, into, the, uh, into the block, and then they put their hands up, and the uh, starter says, take your mark. In track and field, what happens? What happens? They raise their hips. Their hips go to the sky. So why would you ever want your athletes to be on a block like this and 
to be as high as possible. So here, this is a drill I'm doing with her. I'm gonna, we're gonna break the start into three things. Using your arms, using your front leg, and using your back leg. So right now, I'm emphasizing her arms. So I, I, put my, I put my hand, I'm holding her shoulder here, and I'm making her pull as I hold her back to get a feel for what it's like to use her arms. Go ahead. So, so I'm, I tell her, take your mark, go, and I hold her. So you can see her chest wasn't on her leg there. That was good. She has long legs. It's harder if you have long legs. Now remember, you just got to be really aware of how deep your pool is on some of the things that we're going to do here. And, um, we're just working on the arms right now, and, and I'm going okay. to see something she's going to be scared of. Okay, now, okay. this is a, if you do this with your athletes, make sure you do this in a deep pool. Make sure the water is deep. This is how you teach them to use their arms at a start. She's never done this before and she's a little scared. I didn't, I didn't want her to bring her arms forward. I just wanted her to bring her arms out in front of her. I just wanted her to just at first because I wanted her to get used to what it's like to pull with her arms. Just like this, this drill that we were doing. I just wanted her to put herself in a position where she had to use her arms and go through. She's a little nervous. Okay, now she's going to do it the way that I want her to do. It, it looks very easy, but if you if you have young athletes and or if you have female athletes, the, the guys love to do this. Your guys swimmers will love this, and you can always you can always put a kickboard or something on the block so they don't drag their feet across the block. So. So now I'm gonna have her dive in head first. Same same drill except she's on the block. She's gonna pull with her arms. Okay, let's let's kind of stop there. And, so again, it and put, becomes the, put my screen back up. Okay, I'm gonna talk about this and then we're gonna go back to a little bit of film. So, we're working on, that we talked about the position of the fin. We're, we're uh, the, let me tell you a little bit about weight distribution. When you set up on a block, and you want your athlete to set up on the block, they should never have more than 60%, or they should never have less than 60% of their body weight on their front foot. If they have less, then it's going to take too long to get off the block. You should never have more than 40% on your back leg. If you're leaning back too much on your back leg and, you're, and you have more pressure on that, it's going to take too long to get off the block. With a fin, you need to get off the block fast because you're going to have plenty of push against the fin. Your eyes should be straight down, not looking back between your legs, not looking forward, just straight down. The chest, not, the chest not sitting on the leg. Because if, if, you, if you're in that position, then you've defeated the whole purpose of what we just talked about, about track and field, about how athletes in track and field, when you say take your mark, their hips rise. Okay, drills for better starts. We just tar we start, we talked about arms for a minute. When your arms should go like this. Yourself towards water with your elbows into your ribs and 
Now this has done a lot of work on starts, paid a lot of attention to it, talked to a lot of coaches about it on my staff. We really believe this is the best start. And we'll talk about, we're going to talk about angle, as Roman had talked about before with, with um, his athletes. And there, there are so many things, but the more we talk about starts, you'll understand that it's not just for sprinting. It doesn't require any more effort to do a good start. But it can make a huge difference in how far you get. And if you ask your athlete, do you want to start behind in a race? Or do you want to at least start with everyone else or maybe be better? As a coach, you want them to be better. You don't want them to start from behind. So with, as far as the arms are concerned, Now, another drill for, for the front leg. So we've talked about the arms. I've told you what we do. We pull ourselves over the block, head first, teaching athletes to use their arms. The next thing is your front leg. We do a drill where you set up on the block, just like this, and then you raise your back leg. The guy who's me, you, you learn how to reach your arm and with the front leg, what, what the purpose of your front leg is to try and get force from your front leg. So we'll make them dive in, put your back leg up, learn how to dive with just arms and front leg. So now we've talked about arms, we've talked about front leg. Then for the back leg, it's just a matter of, and I'll show you, it's just a matter of kind of standing on the block and learning how to swing your arms and just push as hard as you can with your back leg. So you begin to isolate your arms your front leg and your back leg. And you start looking at a start as something more than just a kid getting on the block and telling them to dive out far. Now all of a sudden they understand the concept that their arms have a purpose, that their front leg has a purpose, that their back leg has a purpose. So you just break it down. And then you talk about the angle of, of the entry. The angle of the entry is going to be, it's the more you can get into, um, there isn't just one perfect angle. I think depending on the size of the athlete, it's, um, you, want them to be, you want them to be tight when they're in the air because you want them to enter tight, which is core, streamline. Uh, it's like um, we would call it, we refer to it sometimes as, as a knife, a ni knifing into the water. Let's go ahead and run that a little bit. Yeah, we'll just we'll go through it a little faster. These are uh, opinions of mine and not just John. Yay! Athletes that just don't use their arms a lot, they think they're really good, but yeah, they're like this. They say go, but they just lift them straight up and dive in. And that's what she kind of did on her first part. Her second one, when I held her back, she's got a feel for it. Now we're going to try another start. A little bit to the, to the leg portion of it. And um, I'll tell you this. I, I apologize for the video because it's, if, if I knew I was going to give this talk, I would have it precisely what I wanted to do in the sequence that I wanted to do it, so. And we just, we've been isolating the arms. So now, does that make you think, do you want to think any differently about how much you put on your front foot and close your back foot? Do you feel like you can put a little bit more on your back foot? Okay, I'm going I'm to skip to backstroke starts here for a second, and I'll, I'll come back and just... I'm, We're just sure. going to address the backstroke start, and I'm just going to point out some things that you can do with your athletes that might make them more comfortable, and I believe by them being more comfortable, they're going to have a better backstroke start. There's a... We she's have, we have she's a not a backstroker, in the pool right now. so you just have but to, normally, I'll explain a little bit, but she's, gonna be it's not gutter, her stroke, so this is a little different for her as well. Pull your toes over the gutter, so your toes will have to be, okay, they can come out looking at this, if, 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 if your athlete would be, um, Emily Silver is our, is our okay, subject that's, that's for torture today, today. and, uh, okay, here's the things about backstroke starting that are different, maybe. 
The higher you can place your feet on the pad, there's less stress that you're going to slip on the pad. But in order to do that and to have a good start, it means that um, you're going to have to move your hips in to the block closer. You're going to have to have a straighter back. And you're going to have to change maybe your head position a little bit because you want to try and get into the water cleanly. And in order to get into the water cleanly, that means that you're going to have to the push off the how you position your back, where your head is. You're, you'll kind of see that her body drags a little bit as she goes through the water. And you don't want that, but she's not a, a real backstroker, so it's best I had. But you'll see, I'll point out a couple things as we go. Go ahead. Um, so, and she's not really a backstroker per se. She made the Olympic team in freestyle. But we're just gonna experiment here a little bit. And so the things that you're gonna want to do, and we're gonna talk about, the first thing is, is the back and how it is positioned either perpendicular or, or, it's, or it's pulled in, whether the butt's out, whether the butt's in, whether the back is back. So these are things that, by looking, watching backstroke starts for a long time, some of the things that, that will, will help with the, the various ways we do this, I'll tell you what they might do to help your backstrokers not smack or not go too deep or, or just not get in the water very cleanly. So the first thing that's important is, um, is to get your athletes comfortable with their foot position on the pad. And then we'll start talking about the difference in whether you want your butt out, your butt in, your back perpendicular to the bottom of the pool or parallel to the side, and then we'll kind of go from there. So right now, what we're going to do is just, we're going to do a backstroke start, and Emily's going to do it sort of a conventional way. I'm just going to let her do whatever start she wants to do, backstroke, and we'll take a look at it. So you go ahead and do a backstroke start whenever you're ready. A little bit more. Stop. Can we go back? Stop. Okay, this, you, you don't want to teach your backstrokers to do this. You don't, you don't want to pull your face into the block. You don't want to, to have your head, you, you don't want to be hunched over because it takes way too long to uncoil, number one. And number two, there's way too much pressure on her feet down, so there's a really good chance she could slip when she tries to do a start. This is not, you don't, you don't want to do this. Okay, go ahead. All right, so you can see that from what she did that time, um, being sort of bent over, hunched over toward the block, there was a little bit of, little bit of drag in her hips. Now remember, she's not a backstroker, but she's a good athlete. A little bit of drag in her hips. And it took her a little bit longer time to get fully released because she was bent over. So this next time, I'm going to ask her to have her back, her butt in a little closer in her back perpendicular to the bottom of the pool. So Em, this time I want your butt in a little bit and I want your back to be straight. Yeah, and even, even maybe a little bit more than that. There you go. So we're gonna try backstroke start this, from here with you go ahead. It doesn't right, take so long to, upper body doesn't take so long to release from the wall. Because she didn't have to release from this position, she was able to release from this position. Ever go to the 11 o'clock position, which is actually having a slight slope back towards the other end of the pool. So this time, instead of being straight up, we're going to actually be this way a little bit. And I'm going to let your head, you're going to look up sort of behind you just a little bit. And this, and this and position could be even one. better. Yeah, but actually look back a little bit more. Because this puts them in a position where they can get into the water cleanly. Not a lot of spring in that step, but you can see that Okay. By by changing the back position and change, and we'll put up the put up the uh, yeah. Okay, so it's you can see that I think having a, a back that's either straight or slightly back, your release is so much easier, and your athletes can get in the water so much cleaner. So when you now now that we've figured out some positions for backstroke starts it changes where you can put your feet. 
And I know with, with Matt, with Matt Grievers, we had worked a lot on very tall guy, but we got his feet higher and his start became so much better. He would only clear, you know, it's not that he was going up real high to clear. He was, his release was great and his feet were really high. But he kept his back, shoulders back, head back a little bit more and was able to go from this position as opposed to So it just, especially for younger kids that can't figure out how to do this, but it obviously works for Olympic champions as well. One day I was at the pool and I was timing someone, uh, Lacey Neimeyer, who was on the 2008 Olympic team. And um, I said to Lacey, okay, I, I just want to time you. I just want to see how fast you can do a 25. And um, so I kind of watched her get set up on the block or set up in the pool. So she's going to push, she's just going to push off and try and swim fast. So she puts her hand on the gutter. She's got her feet about like this. And I said, okay, ready, go. So as I watched her let go of the wall, her, her foot, rotated down a little bit and she pushed off instead of her foot being up in the air placed at um, 10 o'clock she was pushing off at maybe nine o'clock maybe eight o'clock I thought let me see that again so I said I want you to go as fast as you can so you've got to have a great push off puts her hand on the wall puts her feet up I said, ready, go. She, as soon as she let go of the wall, her body automatically rotated and her feet rotated with it. So I thought, okay, if I'm, if I'm asking her to go as fast as she can go, then how come she's not, how come she's not pushing off with her feet facing up like she has set up? So I thought if that's her best push off, if her best push off is ro rotating down with her feet, then why isn't that why, how we want to put our feet on the wall when we push off in a race or when we do a turn? So I just thought this is, for years I'd been teaching flip turns and freestyle, you know, come right over top with your feet or, or maybe just get them a little bit set at say 11 o'clock and you realize that that's not what you want. And so I watched, I went back and I started watching some races and I watched Cesar Cielo. And he would put his feet, he would do a rotation in his flip turn. He would rotate, so by the time he pushed off the wall, his feet were more at eight o'clock than they were at ten o'clock. And he was the fastest turner that I was that I could see that I'd seen. So I just it just I thought, okay, this is way too simple. Something's something's not right here. We've been teaching this flip right over top with your feet, push off, turn your body as you push off the wall. That's not what we want. Even when you do a breaststroke or a butterfly turn, it's the same thing. An athlete comes to the wall, they touch, they drop their shoulder, and by the time they start to rotate, their feet rotate as well. So after I watched Cielo do a couple of turns, I was sold. We started, we started rotating more in the air, and we started to get our feet at least at, least at 9 o'clock, and sometimes even more toward 8 o'clock. Because... <coughs> If I said to someone, I want to see how fast you can swim, that's the push off that they would do. So foot position is, is very important. Um, I, I don't know if, uh, I don't think I have it here, but I'm going to tell you something about Allison Schmidt. Uh, Allison Schmidt swam a 155.9, I think, in... Shanghai in 2011 and Allison was one of those people when she pushes off the wall she's she's lucky if she can get anywhere near the flags she just just wasn't very good at pushing off so Bob through Russell Mark and the guys at USA Swimming we kept filming this and pointing this out and pointing this out and I mean let's face it Michael Phelps changed everybody's underwaters the guy revolutionized everything about underwaters he was the first guy in a 400 IM that would 
stay underwater 15 meters on the last 50 of the freestyle of the 400 IM. And all of a sudden, everybody in the crowd would get so excited and the other coaches, you know, we're all looking at this going, wow, that's really cool, Michael can do that. And nobody thought about, hey, let's start teaching everybody to do that. And then next thing you know, Ryan Lochte's doing it and now every, there's, everybody's doing it. So, Allison Schmidt, she just happened to be the last person to kind of learn it and she's in the pool with Michael all the time. But she had changed, Russell Mark, a guy that works for me, we had done some, we did the filming from the Olympics and she improved so much in her underwaters, just, she was, t her, her past experience was taking four kicks off the start and I think two kicks, two kicks off the walls and now she was taking five kicks off the start and four kicks off the walls and if you watch her race, she's way ahead of everybody now. So, was that any more effort? I'm not so sure it really was. It was just better technique and focusing on something that made a difference. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Allison won the 200 freestyle by two seconds in London. And you might say, well, she swam so much faster than everybody else. You watch her race, yes, she did swim faster, but you watch her race, compared that to what she did in Shanghai one year earlier, it's a different, completely different athlete. So, if it's kind of free, and I mean that like F-R-E-E, -E, it's f free if you have a good start, it's free if you have a good push off, it's free if you have good underwaters, why not do it? It's not, it's no more energy, it's just being more efficient. So, so, some of the things that I think are, are, are great for working on your push-offs, we do run and dives, and the, I, I forget what they call it, but there's a material that they have on top of the 10-meter towers or all the towers so the divers don't slip when they run out to do a dive. We, would lay, we had those in, um, in long, long pieces, and we would lay that on the deck, and we would teach our athletes to run and dive. And why would you do that? Well, because they would learn how to hit the water going really fast and they would have to figure out how to hold a streamline and to see how far they could streamline or learn how to transition the speed from the dive to their first strokes. So that's a great drill. Young, young kids love to do it. Old kids love to do it. All of our kids, it didn't matter. They, they thought that was the greatest thing going when we started doing that. The other thing is, put them on a stretch cord, put them underwater, and pull them underwater in a streamlined position. Your young kids especially, because they'll feel if they're in a streamlined position or not. You're just, you're just pulling them. In a, they're underwater, they're three feet underwater, you've got a stretch cord and you're just pulling them, and they're in a streamlined position, and they can feel if it's a good position or not just by lifting their head, dropping their head, not having a their hands over top, tight, their, their feet pointed, their core tight. You teach them that kind of stuff just by pulling them through the water because they know what feels good on their body. They can feel if there's any drag or not. And then obviously from what I told you about Allison, underwater dolphin kicks. Why would um, the importance of start and push off improvement, um, I think Todd said that uh, Missy was fourth in the 200 freestyle by one one hundredth of a second. In 2008, Michael won his race by one one hundredth of a second in the 100 butterfly. W wouldn't you, doesn't it make sense that you want to have a good start? I don't care if you swim a 1500 or you're swimming a 50. Same on a push off. How many, how many turns are there in a, in, a, in a 400? There's seven turns. If each turn you're able to you're able to have this much of an improvement times seven, that's taller than I am. Wouldn't you want to tell your athlete that if you do this, you're gonna have this much of a head start in the race? It just makes too much sense. Um, and it's, as I said before, it's free. There's no additional, there's no additional charge. Okay, just a couple of quick thoughts about, a couple of quick thoughts about coaching and program development. Look at the first thing. Most successful moments in your life usually happen when you're confident. 
Confidence is the key to your athlete's success. So whatever it takes for you to build your athlete's confidence up, you want to do that. Just whatever it takes, you figure that out for your athletes. If they're confident, just like when you're confident, it's going to happen. You've got a better chance to succeed. Personal growth equals fast swimming. Uh, you, you heard Yuri before talk about Katie and how he wanted her to, to take control of her own swimming, and she's only 15. So many of the athletes that go to the Olympics, their personal coaches aren't there with them. So if you haven't prepared your, co your, your athlete to, to be able to figure out what to do and when to do it, then you haven't helped them. You've coached them, but you've coached them to count on you. You need to coach them to be their best coach. So when the moment comes when they need to be at their best, they can be at their best. And I think it's very important that they have the ability to adjust to all situations. I get kids that would come to college and their first year, freshman year as we call it, and they would come and they would say, um, there's only one taper that works for me. It's, it's worked a couple of times and I know it's the only way that I can rest and be ready to go. And you kind of look at them and you go, um, so you, you've, you're willing to say that maybe two out of 10 times, 20% you, success, you, you're gonna bank your whole season on, on this only one way to taper, only one way to do something. And for us, when they've, when they've come from some, some other place in the country to a college program, it's, it's, a, it's a program that they've chosen and probably with their coach, they agree that it was a good place for them to go to school and they're gonna see completely different training than maybe they've ever seen before. So to think that if I don't eat my power bar one hour before I swim, if I don't get at least eight hours of sleep, if, 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 um, if, it's, if I don't do my stretching routine exactly 15 minutes before I get in the water, I, I, it's, I'm, I'm just not going to swim fast. I mean, come on. You want to teach your athletes that if their suit blows out, they might have to swim with it. What happens if their goggles snap right before they get on the block? What happens if their cap splits? What happens if um, the plane is delayed and you don't get to your hotel until 3 o'clock in the morning and you have to swim prelims the next day? Adversity is a great teacher, and it also teaches your kids to handle situations that might arise, and the more that you do that with them, the more growth that they have, and if, they, if they're advanced in their growth, their personal growth, making them swim fast, that's a piece of cake. That's easy. Hope should never be part of the success equation. If I'm swimming Pierre's kids, and, and I think that, um, and I talked to Pierre and he said, boy, I hope we, you know, I really hope we've done enough work and I, I, I hope I've prepared my kids enough and, and I hope that they're doing what they need to do and, and I sure hope everything goes well. I want to swim his kids. Because hope, hope is delayed disappointment. It's, you don't, you can't be hoping your kid is going to do something. You make sure they're prepared so, you don't get on, so they don't get on the block and hope that they're going to swim fast. Don't let that be part of their mindset or part of your coaching style. It's fun to swim fast. I think everybody, every coach you've heard stand up here has talked about how fun it is when their kids swim fast. And I'm not just talking about in a meet, I'm talking about in practice too. So you want to set it up so they can be swimming fast, so they build their confidence. And if they're confident, they're going to succeed. Choice of words makes a huge difference in practice. For instance, if I said to you, um, we're going to swim 10 100s hard, or we're going to swim 10 100s fast. As an athlete, I think I'd want my coach to say we're going to swim 10 100s fast. So it's not about, it's, it's about you trying to figure out how to say things in a way in which it makes it fun and motivates your kids, just like I used to go to the pool deck and we'd have practice, get ready for practice and I'd look at the team and I'd say, I'm gonna give you a chance to get better today. Now, after you say that a few times over a season, they know that something big's coming at them. 
but it's better than saying, I'm going to pound you into the ground today. It's just the way you use your words. It makes a big difference. Kick more. Let me say that. Kick more. Let me say it. Kick more. Yuri said it. Swimming is, kicking is, is absolutely, in my opinion right now, the most important thing in our sport because it changes the way you ride in the water. All the best athletes have the best body lines. They ride the best. I don't care what stroke it is. If you have a great body line and you have a great kick, you'll probably be pretty good. So a few years back, we just started increasing our load exponentially on kicking and it paid off immediately. I know that, um, I know that if, if uh, Bob was here today, he would tell you some great stories about Michael and the way that, the way that um, he had worked with him since he was probably seven years old. I think they'd been together, I, we were talking 15, they were, they were together like 15 years. And um, needless to say, Michael, uh, Michael Phelps changed our sport. And, and what he did for our sport, I don't think anyone will ever duplicate that. I don't, I don't think that will ever be, we'll ever see anything like that again. The relationship that they had was a tremendous relationship. I hope that all of you have a chance to maybe have a relationship like that with one of your athletes. But it's... Um, he uh, just some some issues came up and he wasn't able to be here. But at some point in time, I'm sure you'll be able to hear Mike, you hear Bob talk about things with Michael and the things that really made a difference and and how things progress. But there is one thing you want to know. Every single one of the coaches we had talked about this last night. We were having a couple of beers together. It's when you have a great athlete, all of a sudden you're a great coach. You know, one one time you have a, a good breaststroker. Everybody thinks you're a great breaststroke coach. Maybe a few years later, you have a great backstroker. Oh, you must be a great backstroke coach. Well, if you have a talented athlete, you look like a really good coach. So I hope everybody here gets to have a great, talented athlete sometime. Um, I appreciate your time. It's, it's great to be here and share things about our sport. And I'm open for any questions you might have. Можно, можно задать вопрос? Что вы думаете о роли первого тренера? Первый тренер спортсмена, который вот именно... О роли, о, роли, о роли в жизни спортсмена, вот именно первого тренера. Того тренера, который его а, научил и выставил на первое его соревнование в жизни. Well, I think, I, I think the most important thing for the first coach is to teach the athletes the proper technique. I think that's the most important thing. Um, to enjoy, to really enjoy the sport, to teach them to enjoy racing. I think too often when it comes to racing, we don't, there, there's a fear in, in um, especially young kids, they, they worry about if they're not going to swim very fast or what's going to happen, do they swim, who are they swimming for, convince them to swim, to compete. 
Well, I mean, what's the worst thing that can happen to you in a competition? What's the worst thing that can happen in a competition? You, you get last. That's the worst thing that's going to happen. It's not life or death. So you want to teach kids to be okay with, they've got to put forth their best effort, but, it's a, but it's, they want to get on the block and they want to race because it's fun to race. It's, it's fun to find out how you're going to do against the other people that you're swimming against. Question. Uh, definitely, you were talking about uh, push off from the wall, the back strap. Uh, how high is alti uh, altitude? Uh, sorry, um, amplitude in the kicking, the back strap when you do the turn. Uh, what is the tempo? Stars, yeah, the tempo. How fast? And, and uh, amplitude. Oh. It, it, it depends on the individual, I think, a little bit. You, you can watch. Is you it can more flat or it's quite high? Well, I think it's important that the upper body is, is um, the upper body doesn't move. It's still. So the movement comes from the hips down. And it depends on the athlete. You, you can, m most of the fastest kickers, it's a little bit, it's, it's a quicker tempo. And it's the, the, the average between the up kick and the down kick is a little bit more concise. So a big wavy kick usually is not the best kick, but the best way to do it is to time your athletes just short distances and kind of get a feel for what they're doing and, and you'll, the watch will tell you. Okay. And one more question about, uh, just now we were talking about track start. What about the grab start? Is it still in use? Because I read an article where they Compared two stars, and they said the grab start is even uh, you can dive further. I don't know it's a better. American article. I, I don't know a better start than what what you saw. Uh, in I think that's the best start. I think breaking down the start is important, as I said before about the arms and the front leg and the back leg. But as as far as I can tell, that's still the fastest start, and and it's the it's the start that that we're teaching. Okay, thank you. Is it on? Okay. Um, you talked about the individual starts. But over the years, we've seen the starts for relays change. The position of the arms, the movement that are doing the rounded movement, looking for a faster entry into the water, not overseeing the position of the feet. What can you share with us about that kind of starts that are being practiced? In the United States, the collegiate swimming and the high school swimming relays are, are usually double the points of an individual. So we place a huge value on, on relays. And so just like anything else, you, look, you try and figure out how to be faster on relays. One of the big parts about being faster on a relay is to have a great relay takeoff. In order to have a great relay takeoff, you want to try and create momentum, movement on the block so you can carry that momentum into the water. For us, it's um, the fin. The fin now on the back of the block is changing things a little bit because we used to, without the fin, we had tried all sorts of things. Everything from um, a two-foot hop to a step up with one leg. Right now, pretty much what we do is, with the fin, we'll put one foot up over the edge of the block. We'll put the back foot against the fin. And we'll use an arm swing movement where we're here. And as the athlete's coming in, we're going to try and create momentum with as hard of an arm swing, as fast of an arm swing as we can, and a step up motion. And since you already have, since one foot is already, the toes are curled over the edge, it's, it's easier to place the other foot there when, that, when one foot is up there. That's what we think. 
but that doesn't mean that that's going to be what we do for right now. That's where we are, but we'll figure it out because because we're all about relays and relay takeoffs are are very very important. Um, Roman, are you here? I don't know if he was here or not. He he went to he had told you he went to Auburn University, great one of the best swimming schools in the United States, great relays, and I'm sure that he's brought that to French swimming. The, the, the amount of time and effort that has spent in the United States working on relay takeoffs and, um, and you know, the athletes that won, the French won the four by one in London. I'm sure their relay starts are a reflection of the work and effort that's done to make them better. Um, in relation to kick, 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 uh, your concept of kicking more, um, a couple of years ago at the FINA Medical Congress, uh, one of the researchers suggested that kicking with a kickboard is an impingement motion for the shoulder. And I was just wondering your take on, I know Todd had mentioned a lot of active balance kicking. Um, do you recommend that kickboards are necessary from a developmental stage, or is it something that you could phase out and work on balance and kicking mostly? I think that's a good point, and you're, you're right. There, there can be some issues with the kickboard and the body position and the stress on the shoulders. I think that, yes, you can, I mean, the snorkel has changed everything so much now. You can, you can kick with your arms at your side um, and you can kick with one arm up, one arm back. You can do all sorts of various things with a snorkel on or you can kick on your back. But one nice thing about kicking with a kickboard with a team is that you can't hide. I'm kicking, I'm in lane one, you're in lane eight, I can see you if you're beating me or if I'm beating you. So it, there's a time when you can use kicking. It's, it's a great, it can equalize everything for your team. You, sometimes the distance swimmers aren't as good as the sprinters, but when it comes to swimming a long set, the distance swimmers would, would obviously have an advantage over the sprinters. So you can, Use kicking as a way in which you unite your team and there's no hiding. You, you, you know where you are. And um, I, I like that. I used to, we used to kick as a team, we would kick two times a week, we would kick sets of 4,000 meters long course. And we would just, and it was always, and you can talk to your athletes when they're on a kickboard too. You can say, hey, this is not, you, you wanted to break 50 seconds in the 100 freestyle, kicking at that speed is not happening, come on, let's go. You can, you can encourage them, you can be on them all the time. It's, you can say, hey, guy two, two, two lanes over is, is beating you. What's, you can do so many things when their head's out of the water, you can communicate in a way in which you can't normally. But you're, you're right, you have to be careful because it can create some issues. But you can kick all sorts of different ways now, and I think with young kids, putting fins on them, it's great. But I want to go back to what just kicking in general, it changes the body line. And if you look at the best breaststrokers, the best butterflyers, backstrokers, freestylers, it's the body line. And if you maintain that body line the longest, you maintain it. And that's why people are learning how to do it for 800, like Yuri was talking about, or for 1500. It's, it's changing everything. You show us some good drills on uh, the start with one foot up and pulling of the block. Are there any good drills for backstroke start? For this, for backstroke starts, yeah. um, it for young for young athletes, th the most difficult thing to do in backstroke is to try and figure out how to push off the wall and and keep your body out of the water so there's less drag. And honestly, I don't know other than. And this is, you just got to be really careful. It's, it's kind of, it's a fun thing to do, but to teach your kids how to, to sort of make the arc that they need, you can have them hold on to the, um, have them hold on to the, to the side of the pool and just go off and come back to that same position. So they just make a loop. And you have to be careful because some of them are so good, they come back fast and they can hit their head against the wall. But most of them, 
they don't, they get it. And it, it teaches them to go from this position to a back arch position right away, which is what it takes at an early age to keep your body out of the water when you push off the wall on your back. So that's the only drill that I remember working with kids that, that dragged their, their legs and, their, and their, their butt through the water. That was the only drill that we used. Please uh, justify the use of nose clip and backstroke starts. The, the um, question was using a nose clip, and it's, uh, I, I, think it's, I think it's really important for some people to use a nose clip or at least to try it because it's, it, it takes away the, the possible error, error of losing air immediately while you're underwater it's you know it's you can you can you can be a lot more disciplined when your nose is pinched so i think it's i think it's a great tool to use now as athletes get better some of them don't use it they don't need it but most of the athletes that we worked with at least during a time when we were trying to teach them to be better underwater they use a nose, a nose pinch, a nose clip. Oh yeah, sure. It, it just depends on, on how good they are and if they feel comfortable that they're disciplined enough, they, they've disciplined their body enough. But if, um, it just depends. But I think if it makes them faster, you use it. I don't care what it is. Okay, thank you very much.